Thank you so much for being here this evening. Are you ready? Yeah. Woo! All Here's right, gentlemen, come on out. Dom Giordano, the Dean, and Donald Trump Jr. Continue, continue. We have time. Just keep going. It's keep fine. Keep going. Don loves it. It's fine. I'm a Trump. We like it. I didn't tell Don yet. You know how many times I get called Don. So for tonight, you're going to have two Dons up here. We'll uh, continue with that. I'd like to begin. When I told you, I didn't have the uh, Trump book in front of me. Don and I talking about it backstage. And everybody in the entourage backstage, the letters to Trump that you have now, it is a coffee t a table book. Turn to page, if you have your book, I don't know if you can see, 98, you'll see one, Alec Baldwin, <laughs> who wrote, Dear Donald, for a tough guy in a tough business, you are a sweet and generous man. I could never thank you sufficiently for the use of the incredible penthouse you comped us. You're a gentleman, best, Alec. And this book, <laughs> right, let's keep that, let's start with that. <laughs> Don, is that your favorite in the uh, letters to Trump, or is there another one that tops that? I mean, th that's pretty special, given the, the, the insane level of Trump derangement syndrome uh, we saw take over uh, Alec Baldwin and the Saturday Night Live cast and all of those things. But, you know, I, I think we, we put together this book, really, to point out just the level of hypocrisy. Uh, you know, that's exactly. out there. You saw, I mean, I think maybe the favorite letter uh, may not even be that one because of what happened at the DNC last week or two weeks ago. Oprah Winfrey uh, talking about what a ticket they would make if they <laughs> ran together with her as his vice president. Now, this is a couple of years ago. Uh, but again, it, it shows uh, how quickly uh, the world changes. I, you know, I wrote about it in my first book, Triggered. Uh, I wrote the story about... June 16th, 2015, when my father went down sort of the infamous escalator ride. Well, before the escalator ride, there was an elevator ride. It was me, my brother, sister, family, you know, uh, my daughter Kai, uh, my son Donnie. And we all got in the elevator together as a family. And my father just looked me straight in the eye. And I just remembered it because, you know, he's, he's one of those you learn the hard way. He doesn't often sort of point out some of these things. He just goes, and now we find out who our real friends are. Wow. And, like, that was a – it sort of hit because it was – it, two things. It wasn't just that he understood the real world, which he does. It's why we had the successes. He gets it. He's not, you know, mm -hmm. not a bureaucrat that just, this is how it's supposed to be, therefore it is. He just, he understands the real world. Uh, but more importantly, he understood exactly what was going to happen, and he did it anyway. Uh, and I think perhaps that's the most important Quick thing. Quick question, though. Did, how much did he, because, um, and here in Philadelphia, my Listeners heard me today talk about Jimmy Kimmel, enough said about him, but the type of stuff that you face, it's yeah. not just him, Melania, etc. Baron Trump, for example, who looks like just a great kid who's interested in things, might be six foot nine, we don't know, and immediately under attack in the most vicious ways. I mean, someone, you know, you accomplish in business, your age, etc., that's bad enough. But, but my son yeah. were Baron Trump, that's tough to take. No, it's not easy. Listen, I... I yeah, I guess I, I found out I was probably a lot more like my father than I ever realized because of politics. Like, I just, I kind of like the fight, and I'm okay with it. And, yeah. you know, I, now I wake up, if it's like a Tuesday, if I, have, if I haven't been subpoenaed by like 9 a.m. on a Tuesday, <laughs> I'm like, they must be plotting against me. I think I'm the most subpoenaed person in the history of U.S. government, and I'm not even in the government. I understand, I understand I am not the upstanding citizen that Hunter Biden is, I know. Wait a minute, I that's know, I, I'm just... You know, that's, I'm the that's... father of five. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm not a crackhead, so I understand I don't have the Democrat morals of Hunter Biden, but I think I have a feeling, Dom, if it was my laptop, it'd have right. been a problem. Hey, Don, it, it, you, there was no, like, 52 intelligence agents, you know, coming to save my butt uh, when they tried me for treason, a, tri a crime punishable by death. Uh, you know, for the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax. So, you know, as the number two target of that, but 
you know, again, for me, it was like they backed me in a corner and I just, you, you run. Donna, I, I just have I one fought. piece of advice. You got to loosen up here with this audience. Yeah, you got to okay, say okay. what you really think. No, but, to, <laughs> but for me, it's different, right? But everyone yeah. doesn't react the same way. I mean, I, I saw oh, yeah. that, you know, I saw that with my daughter. You know, when The View started attacking my 17 year old daughter uh, because she spoke at the RNC, you know, and there was nothing of substance because The View, the host of The View, they're, they're morons, right? But it, but it's still. The reality is it wasn't even that she was political. That's my daughter. We, we spoke about it backstage. Yeah, exactly. she, you know, my daughter, Kai, she's 17. She's a really good golfer. So she plays a lot of golf with my father. She probably spends more time with my dad one-on-one -on -one than, like, anyone in our family because of that. And they're, so they're like buddies. It's funny. Like, I'll, uh, and it's a side he doesn't even show or doesn't even like to show. But, like, you know, I'll show up, and she's chatting on the phone. I think she's talking to one of her friends. I'm like, who was that? She's like, oh, that was Grandpa. I'm like... For 20 minutes, you're making smile. Like it, 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 it's sort of funny. And so she was the one that was with me. Uh, I, I got the strange call that Saturday when my father was shot. And she's earlier in the day, she's like, hey, I really want to go fishing. And that doesn't happen. Like when your 17-year-old daughter calls you, like that's like blue moon territory. Right. Like I want to hang out with you, dad. I'm like, who are you and what have you done with my daughter? Uh, and, you know, so we went out there and we were fishing. And that's when I got the call, uh, you know. You know, Don, your father's been shot. I don't look. And, uh, yeah, they, I mean, there's only levels of bad when you get the call that someone's been shot, right? It's just a question of how bad. And we didn't know, and we didn't know for 90 minutes. Uh, and so we ran in, and we're there, and we finally got him on the phone, and, you know, just like, okay. He, First he, thing he said, what did he say to you? You told well, me before. Well, I, yeah. I, I told him, I go, listen, you, you know, when, when I, by then I had seen sort of the social media, yeah. and, he, you know, he'd come up, you know, defiant. You know, these days, everyone's a tough guy on the Internet, right? You know, everyone's a badass on Twitter, on a, behind a keyboard. Not that many people are actually tough in real life. Uh, and so when you get shot in the face and you come up tough, uh, that's sort of the ultimate test. And that, that, now it proves what we all probably knew. All the dictators of the world, they understood that Trump was tough. It's why they didn't trifle with him, right? But, you know, so I just said, literally, I go, you know, I knew he was alive at that point. So I go, hey, man, you're the... Biggest badass I've ever seen. And I, you know, and, you know, we sort of talked about that for a little bit. And then, you know, but it's still such an uncomfortable, you know, 90 minutes of no knowledge. You couldn't get through on cell phones. You know, I guess the one thing Secret Service did right that day, they shut down communications in case there was IEDs or whatever, who knows. Um, and, you know, after that, I had to ask, I was like, you know, just to break the ice. Because it's, you sure. know, Absolutely. so I'm the guy that will always be inappropriate. So I was just like, so listen, more importantly, how's the hair? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don, Don, the hair is fine. The hair, Wait, the hair we, we is fine. It's a little bloody, Don. It's a little <laughs> bloody, but, but, you know. <laughs> we need more of that. Yeah, you, more. you know, it yes. was, yeah. I, I, you know, I, listen, like, looking back, I'm like, you're an idiot, Don. Like, why did you, but, like, I think we all actually probably needed that icebreaker, and then, like, everything was okay. You get sort of the adrenaline dump of, like, this... Right, to, Don, to that point, I had Eric on. Yeah. He was very complimentary of Secret Service agents. And these guys did jump on your father yeah. to try to protect him. But this ongoing investigation, et cetera, with our listeners, yeah. this, and it wasn't even mentioned during the debate, which we'll get to. Of course. What, what's your, what are your thoughts on it? Listen, uh, there, there are guys, you know, I, I had a Secret Service detail. I think I was told I was the most requested Secret Service detail because I do right. cool stuff and I treat my guys well. And, I, you know, Eric and I both, were, you know, come from, like, competitive long-range shooting backgrounds. I mean... Some of the heads of the counter sniper training program, they've literally stayed at my cabin uh, on weekends to train on their own because, like, my range up in actually in northeast Pennsylvania right. you know, is better than what they have at Quantico and further. Like, some of the guys and some of my dad's personal team are incredible. Okay, but you hear the stories now. It's like, well, the local guys that were supplemented in there, they were HSS guys, they weren't mm -hmm. Secret Service guys. They... I'm like, wait a minute. So, one of the most threatened people in the world, the presumptive nominee of the party, the inevitable nominee, a former president. You're putting, like, C-team actors. Like, I know the guys. I have lifelong friends in the Secret Service. And it's like I make the distinction when I talk about the FBI or otherwise. There are the bureaucrats in charge that make the decisions, and then there are the door kickers. The door kickers almost invariably love us, right? It's going to be the same at the Secret Service. The bureaucrats, it's a very different story. We've seen that with the FBI, right? Everyone that's committed a crime in America, they've been on their watch list, but they won't do anything because they check a couple of woke boxes, but they'll go arrest an Amish farmer for selling unpasteurized milk. Right. You know, <laughs> true story, though. I mean, where's the lie? I mean, the, the school shooter last week, they were on a radar for, what, 18 months? 
You know, so he kills four people. You know, it's trans ideology, so they can't look after, you know, they can't do anything about it because God forbid. But, you know, you look at sort of the trans mafia and you look at the violent crime that's been perpetrated and you look at some of these mass killings, whether it's what happened up in Wisconsin, whether it's, you know, well, we can't pursue that because, you know, right. that, that would conflict with our gender theory ideals. Uh, and, and it's just disgusting. You know, you've had enough. So I do make that distinction. I mean, it was a gross... Uh, gross problem as it relates to the Secret Service. No one gets within 130 yards. So, you know, my father's not a shooter. I was explaining to him. I'm like, that's like missing a six-inch putt. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's why, honestly, whatever faith you know, I had, uh, whatever faith my father had or our family, and probably a lot of Americans, whatever it was, people were like, someone was looking out for him. Yeah. Like, I, I... Absolutely. I, I've been to... I, I'd say, you know, I've been to, let's call it, a billion rallies. Uh, I, well, the Trumps have to say a billion, Yeah, of about, about, yeah exactly. about a billion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Give or take. Uh, I, I've literally never even seen my father, like, point to a chart or a graph. Like, I've never seen it happen. And right. it, happened, it happened to be an immigration graph, ironically. Uh, but, you know, to turn Beautiful immigration. Beautiful moment, immigration. Graph, but again, yes. to the, to the yeah. failures, you know, they, yeah. they knew about a shooter with a range, potential shooter with a range finder. You, know, you don't bring a range finder to an event, right? Like, unless, let's see, right? Come on. Like, this is common sense stuff. You don't have to be, uh, you know, law enforcement to understand this. You have now the body cam footage, the local police, whose job that is not to do. They, they're not used to looking for snipers on roofs or the Secret Service. That is their job. It's what they're trained to do. I had a detail for four years. I know the level of detail they get into, you know, they're training for the point oh 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 one percent chance of something happen. When there's local cops being like, this isn't right, this is, you should do something about it. And they do that 10 minutes before my father gets on the stage. Exactly. And they let him go on anyway. Like, there's no other explanation. Like, it, like all the other things that have been, you know, dubbed conspiracy theories that turned out to be 100% true about six months later. Like, there's no other plausible explanation for that. Um, you know, and then the, again, the divine intervention, a, you know, a guy with a rifle has 10 minutes to make a shot at 130 yards. It's like, again, yeah, someone exactly. was looking out. Exactly. So yeah, no, I, I do make the distinction my I father's team and those guys, I mean, they're calling me, they, they, trust me, you know, and they're in the line of fire too. They're as pissed off as we are. Good part, to hear. Pardon the vernacular, but I, you know, I think I, I think Good I probably hear. have let's call it the right to be a little upset about it, given, given well, the situation. Backstage, we were talking, maybe a little upset, the debate on Tuesday yeah. night. I was watching in the spin room, as I told you. Where were you watching, and what were you yeah, saying? Yeah, I, I, was, I was in Ohio, actually. I was doing all-day events right. with Bernie Moreno over there, you know, trying to you know, win up uh, some United States Senate seats. So I did five events there, you know, you know coincidentally right next to, right near Springfield. Uh, we'll get to it. Where, where they definitely weren't eating dogs and cats until now everyone realizes they actually were. And there were calls from two weeks ago before it was a meme and before it was a story. And, uh, you know, that, that's not the outrage cycle. You know, it, once it became about a cat, all of a sudden it got in the news. But the fact that actual citizens from these towns are getting nothing while they're giving thousands of dollars a month to migrants that have been transplanted there. And the citizen, you know, that outrage and those tears from genuine people just upset at, at what's going on. That gets no coverage. Uh, once it became about a cat and people were trying to make it a meme, the media all of a sudden showed a lot of interest trying to disprove it. <laughs> then it turns out it's actually happening. Now there's 911 calls back in August. Uh, there's four Haitians in the park and they're killing the local geese and eating them. It, right. You know, it, it's, it's just disgusting. And so you watch the debate and you see, you know, now, now there's a story, apparently, that someone saw an affidavit that's been signed by a whistleblower from ABC News that said Kamala Harris was promised they would only fact-check Trump. Here's a list of essentially the questions, and all, which doesn't surprise me even a little bit, right? Because there's precedent. Donna Brazile, as head of the DNC, did this for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Like, do we believe they won't do it again? Do we believe there's nothing they wouldn't do to win? Like... We're not playing a fair fight. Does anyone think ABC News, before the debate, 100% of the coverage of Kamala Harris was positive. 93% negative against Trump. That's before you even got to the debate. Yeah. Um, you know, they, it's as though Kamala Harris doesn't have a record. It's like she started her political career about a month ago when she became the nominee. Not that she's literally a San Francisco radical leftist daughter of a Marxist professor 
who was rated right. the most liberal senator in the United States Senate, like left of Bernie Sanders, because at least Bernie Sanders probably cares about American jobs. Kamala Harris would just rather import people rather than actually satisfy her voters. Um, you know, they, so you know it's going to be a hit job. You just, you, you still sort of want to believe, right? Like, I want to believe, you know, the FBI is going to do the right thing. I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. Most of the three-letter agencies are that way. When they went after me, uh, initially, like I said, Russia, 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 it's like, well, there must be something to it, Dom. You know, I took 10,000 selfies. Maybe there was, an, you know, some sort of spy that took a selfie with me that, you know, I don't know. Like, I, I, I literally, I, I, I was, honestly, I was naive. I wanted to believe that everything that I believed about America actually existed. I want, I, in, instead, I now know I'm fighting to create the America I thought existed, to allow us to all live in what I thought existed, not what actually was. I, you know, I imagine it was broken since the 60s, and now that I've become friends with RFK and you have these conversations and we talk, you know, and I'm like, wow, you realize just how bad it was for how long? I think it just took Trump and the hatred of him to really bring out, you know, where they're just not even pretending, right? They're saying the quiet parts out loud each and every day. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that's important. I think so many Americans have been, you know, woken up to just how broken these systems are. You're watching that, though. You see David Muir doing, and your dad has taken down the best of them in that. So what are you thinking when Muir is constantly fact-checking? Arrogantly fact checked. Well, and, that, and by the way, frankly, lying yeah, about that. Yeah, the fact checks yeah. weren't even accurate fact checks. It was you're just, the type of guy that would jump on that, right? So I, what, I would. Yeah, it, yeah, no, I was. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, you know, again, I'm not thrilled. I'm not. The problem is, I'm not surprised. Okay. Right. So it's one of those. Like, it's just. It's those aren't the rules that were laid out, but those are the rules of the overall game at this point. Exactly. And they again. It's, it's the Don Jr. versus Hunter Biden. Right. It's just different. You can't talk about Hunter Biden. He's. He's the child of a president. He's not even in office. Well, I'm not in office either. He's older than me. I didn't take a billion dollars from China. I didn't take millions from Ukraine. I didn't take... If I would have, it would have been a problem. Mm -hmm. But it's just different, you know? No, no, well, he has an addiction issue. No, 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 no. We, we all know people that have addiction issues. It's a terrible thing. Terrible. It does not absolve you from being a piece of garbage in every other aspect of your life. It, it doesn't allow you to sell out your country to profit off of your father's position in office. You know, you look at the, you see the numbers. I mean, it comes out in Congress and media doesn't even talk about it. I mean, the grandchild who's seven years old, he made $2.7 million from Ch whatever the number is. Like, the grandchild's on China's payroll? Well, they're just giving it all to the family. I'm like, again, if I took one cent from China, it would be a problem. And I'm actually an international businessman. That's what we did before we got into this. Hunter was not, right? It, it, it's a little different. Uh, so, you know, I understand that we play by different rules. We shouldn't have to. Uh, exactly. you know, I sort of feel if the rules were reversed, uh, you know, the media would be under investigation from the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission. They would be in-kind contribution to the tune of a trillion dollars. Big tech would all be in jail for doing the same thing. Uh, but if they're doing it against conservatives, it's just, you know, that's fine. It's, it's, we, it's a means to an end. It's okay. We'll, we'll forget the rules. We'll forget everything, right? Just like, isn't that the best way to go back at that? Isn't that what Don Trump Jr. would do? Yeah, well, I, you know, it, yeah, yes. <laughs> exactly, I thought yeah. you would, yeah. yeah. But, you know, again, I think my father's, you know, trying to, to maintain a level of civility up there with it, but it, but it is hard, it's because it's, because there's nothing civil about it, right? They're, they're literally trying to knife you on a stage. It's, it's no different than, again, the sort of, the years of commentary, uh, you know, that led up to his assassination, right? It, when someone's out there in the media and big tech, they're saying, the guy, he's literally Hitler. He's the greatest threat to democracy. He's actually worse, right? Just like January 6th was worse than 9-11. I'm trying to figure out why. I can't. I'm like, I don't know. I saw, like, grandmothers with, like, selfie cams, like, walking through the, you know, staying inside the velvet ropes. You know, they spend more time in jail than probably most of the, you know, the radical shooters or the, you know, that, mm -hmm. that they're catching these days and, or not catching, you know, catching after the fact. Uh, it, it's just such disparate treatment. Uh, I think what people have to realize, like, it's only a matter of time till they come after you, yeah. right? You know, Trump's just in the way right now, but you think, uh, like, you know what? We got rid of Trump. It's going to stop? It's not stopping. They're normalizing it. So, again, eight, nine years of calling someone, of course, hey, someone's going to take a shot at it. That was created by the media. When you actually look at it, like, 
Who's actually acting like the fascists? I know the Democrats sort of, you know, they hold the trademark on calling everyone they disagree with as fascists, but conservatives aren't locking up their political opposition. They're not trying to seize no, their no. assets. They're not changing the statute of limitations in New York State like they are against us. They're not allowing literally judges whose daughters are the number one prolific fundraisers for the Democrat Party to preside over cases and then essentially selling seats to the trials. Like, like that's actual fact, fascist activity, and it's done by the Democrats. And it's not just against Trump. Whether it's the censorship that I'm sure anyone that's in this room right now has probably dealt with online, uh, you know, whether it's the others that they've tried to lock up using, you know, again, January 6th as an example, peaceful pe protesters didn't even know they were probably there They spent three years in jail without due process. That's fascism. It's not coming from Republicans. It's coming from Democrats in so, Democrat controlled areas with so, Democrat judges and Democrat stacked juries where they know they can get away with it because there's no opposition. So we've been telling listeners here tonight then we're going to ask you, what, what do you advise on? What do you think? Do you do another debate? President Trump said no third debate. We realize the deck is stacked, but she's going to coast. Yeah. Without uh, you any know, I, I'm torn on it. I think yeah. you, know, you, you can do another one. You cannot. I, you know, I, I don't know that it makes a difference. I, I, you know, I think, frankly, the most important thing from, from the debate was really my father's closing statement. Uh, well, two things, really. The closing statement, which is, hey, first of all, you had the visual. You, you, everyone realizes it was stacked, right? So no one was thinking. It was, I don't think anyone, e even the biggest liberal, maybe they're fine with the results, but they're, they, they realized it wasn't exactly what we'd call, uh, you know, uh, an arm's length, uh, you know, negotiation. This was, this was a stacked <laughs> deck. But the closing argument, which is fine, when were you actually better off? Are you better off today than you were four years ago? If these policies continue, and Kamala Harris literally cut and pasted, including the source code, so we know it's the same, the Biden policies, if we have another four years of this disaster, like, can we even recover as a country? Right? You know, I, I see this stuff all the time. You know, Don, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm on the road. I'm, I go to small parts of America, you know, as a hunter, fisher, shooter, take right, my kids there. Right. Like, I sort of, I spent a lot of time in, like, real America. Um, and, you know, when and if I take my kids, I took my kids, and we came back from a fishing trip last summer, and I was sitting there. We went to McDonald's, and it was my 11-year-old, my 15-year-old, and me. And it was $48. <laughs> and I, no, listen, I, I get it. I'm Donald Trump Jr. Like, it's not changing my habits. Right. I, I, I'm not pretending I'm changing my habits. But if I have sticker shock, no, no, think about that. If I'm like, damn, that's expensive. What's happening to like a hardworking, like blue collar family making 50, 60, they, it, they're getting crushed. Right, you combine that, you combine that with inflation, you know, across the board. Uh, you combine that with the insane levels where that interest rates have gone, right? You know, if I buy a new truck, fine, I'll buy all cash. I'm not hit with the interest rate penalty of that. Someone else is buying a new truck for their business, exactly. now they're paying 7% on top of the already inflated cost of the trucks. You know, decent pickup truck, it's, it's you know, 75, 80 grand. You know, and that's, it wasn't that long ago when you I bought a pickup truck for 40. It doesn't feel like it was that long ago, right? So you combine that, then you add in the interest rate, and all of a sudden, it's just debilitating. And they don't care. And again, then they'll bring in 100,000 Haitians that can't read and can't drive, and they'll put them into an area, into a town, Springfield. 20,000 Haitians put into a town, you know, and I'm sure Springfield would love to take in a few people and help them and do the right thing. I mean, America's the most generous country in the world by far. But you put in 20,000 into a town of 50,000, and it's a problem. And then they give them driver's license, and they start driving, yeah, and then can, they get into accidents. Can you tell Don, listeners, like, you're inside this. You're with Bernie Morano. You're yeah. prosecuting that in Ohio. Yeah, I was in Lima. You Who know, makes that decision? It seems to be... Kamala like, Harris is on tape right. bragging about yeah. it. Yeah. But, but again, it, to, to the cost point of view, it, they're, then they give them everything for free. Then they get free health care. Like, we have to, you know, I know I pay a copay. I have deductibles. I pay insurance premiums. They have none of those things. They can go into any hospital. It doesn't have to be in network, because there is no network. They can go into any hospital and receive the finest health care in the world while never paying into the system. You guys all have deductibles. You all have copays. You all pay premiums. You, you know, and you have to be in network. They can just do this. So these, these people get crushed. Then, they, again, they give them driver's license. They start driving, but they come from Haiti. There's not a lot of driving in Haiti, so they're not particularly good at it.
So they start hitting other cars and causing accidents in the area. Then the entire area becomes an area that's problematic. Problematic in that there's a lot more accidents. So you could have a perfect driving record. Okay, you could, no speeding tickets, no nothing. But your insurance premiums go through the roof because there's a bunch of people driving that shouldn't be driving in the area. You bear the burden of that, not them. So bad, we have a guy coming on tomorrow. There's one in Pennsylvania that wants to put stop signs in Creole in addition to English. Yeah, because, no, but, guys, in all fairness, like, the red, you know, kind of, you know, octagonal, like, stop sign is, is sort of a global universal, right? Everyone, right. everyone knows that what that is. But, you know, the issue is also, listen, the reality, it sounds terrible, but, like, the average IQ in Haiti is 67, okay? I read that stat this week. That's, you couldn't stand, you couldn't stand trial for capital punishment if you murdered a bunch of people at that level because you, you wouldn't be deemed competent. So, you know, if you import the third world entirely at a level that's unsustainable, you're going to become that. That's just, that's basics, that's how it works. It, it's not nice, it's not kind, it's reality. And, and they're witnessing it, and they're only doing it in these towns that are conservative places, they're rural areas. You know, notice, you know, they don't send them to Martha's Vineyard. Right? When Ron DeSantis sent eight people to Martha's Vineyard, it was outrage. Like, it was a novelty for about five minutes. You know, the liberals got their selfies like they were doing a good thing, and then they said, okay, enough of this, get them out of here. Any thought, one of the listener questions tonight, we got great questions for you from listeners. Do a town hall, your dad, right there in Springfield, Ohio. 100%. 100%. Good idea? Yeah. Because... Obviously, the president was making the theme illegal immigration, what happens from it. But when you're, you're off balance with three people and all that, yeah. nothing more telling than going to a place like that when he went to East Palestine. Hear from the people. Give them, yeah, exactly. East Palestine is another example. Yeah. It's not even about immigration, but it was about just the right. neglect of those hardworking blue-collar Americans. Right? If they're not on your side, it doesn't matter. Right? No one showed up. Biden showed up a year later when it's an election year. You know, just, you know, he'll, now, he'll say he's from... Scranton, Pennsylvania, every time... I spend more time in Pennsylvania. I went to boarding school here, I went to college here, I have a farm in Pennsylvania. I spend more time in PA than Joe Biden ever did because he left when he was nine, but he still hangs his hat on those bona fides as though they're real. Because, again, for them, it's all about optics. Right? It's not blue-collar Joe. Joe never had a blue-collar job in his life. I've worked more blue-collar jobs than Joe Biden because my father made me do those jobs you know, growing <laughs> up in a construction business. That's what we did. Yeah. Uh, my brother, too. That's, you know, but... You know, they, they get the advantage of having that media complex push whatever it is, you know, that they need. Let's turn to J.D. Vance. You were apparently very instrumental. You're friends uh, with him. Yep. You saw a lot of things in there. The other night, for example, he was on CNN about Springfield with Caitlin yeah. Collins, yeah. who's one of the biggest ideologues. I feel for you to boo. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he handled that beautifully. Yeah. He turned it around, and then he talked about what the issue is. These poor people being inundated yeah. by 20,000 people being put in there. How did you see J.D. Vance as a potential VP? I got, I got to know him uh, you know, over the last few years, and he sort of started off as a Trump hater, really. You know, it, the re, that was the reality, but you know, he was sort of buying into that media narrative. You can be smart and educated and still you know, think that. And by the way, in 2016, if you're like, wait, this guy from New York City is going to be you know, the leader of the conservative movement? Like, I, by the way, I understand the skepticism. But J.D. was one of those guys that didn't just like some of the Republicans. There's plenty of the rhinos that, let's say, now reluctantly accept Trump. And it's like, okay, I'll do this. I'll re fundraise off of him. I'll use his name to get elected. And then I'll snake him. Uh, you know, J.D. was actually like, oh, wow, I was, I was totally wrong. I got this. So we got to know each other pretty well. Uh, I, I was a big advocate for him for that Senate seat in Ohio. And I think he probably became, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, if not the best, the certainly, you know, one of the top three. Uh, you know, conservative senators in the country. And then when we were talking about, you know, th this race, I just said, he's literally our only option. Uh, Why is that? Why the only because, option? Because of what you said. He's the only guy that can go into hostile enemy territory and, and, and fight back that way. The other Republicans, they'll buy into the narrative of the left. Okay, fine, but, you know, maybe here. No, Caitlin, you're wrong. This is what it is. And when you combine that with his backstory, I mean, this is, you know, it, it's... Sort of interesting. Well, Jim and I, got, I grew up in the you know, 67th Trump floor Tower. of Trump Tower. Trump Tower he grew up in Appalachia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but I had read his book back in you know when, when it first came out. Um, you know, before he had presumably before he had political aspirations. I was like, wow, we need guys like this running. Uh, you know, someone who understands that. 
uh, who came from those things. He understands you know, the vicious cycle of you know, poverty and addiction uh, that has taken over so many of these things. He's been in those towns. I mean, I saw it a little bit at, at the Hill School, frankly, in Pofftown, you know, which was the home of Firestone Tires and Mrs. Smith's Pies, and right. that was all gone when I got there. And so, you know, I, I, I sort of, my, my high school years from eighth grade on were sort of formed in, you know, like a Rust Belt kind of town that time had forgotten and so much had moved away from that were once, you know, pretty prosperous places, but stupid politicians, corrupted politicians, decided, you know what, if we save two cents on a widget by sending your American dream to China, you know, it's good for their shareholders and therefore it's good for them because they'll make more campaign donations and so they sold out uh, the American working class. And so, you know, I, I, again, I understand the irony of where I came from from that, but like my formidable years and my formation years were spent either there or before that, as a young kid, my mother, who escaped communist Czechoslovakia, sent me there every summer. I spoke the language fluently. I had friends there. I've waited in the bread lines that Bernie Sanders thinks are so glamorous. Wait a minute, you speak it. Czech? Is that the I language? I speak fluent Czech, yeah. Can you give us a little Czech, Don? I'm living perfect to Czechia. I'm moving a little silly then. No coffee, no cream. Yeah, yeah, no sugar. Exactly. No sugar. <laughs> I so, didn't know that. Yeah, so wow. I, you know, I grew yes. up in, like, I spent my summers in communist Czechoslovakia, and it, it, was, it was great, but I also... I learned to appreciate what we have here as America. It's, I, our freedoms, right. uh, you know, the, the ability to have that kind of prosperity. I've seen what those systems uh, will do to intelligent, hardworking people. But when there's no incentive, there's no upside to working more. That you're not going to. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, from an early perspective, I guess that was the sound, kind of foundations of my political leanings. Is you know, contrary to popular belief, there's not a lot of sons of billionaires from Manhattan uh, that are. Pretty ardent conservatives, just if you didn't know. I, I was supposed to be a libtard, okay? Like, I, yeah. <laughs> I'll wait on that. That's good. Uh, the, next, the next figure I wanted to talk with you about is RFK Jr., okay? I used to have him on, and true story, we did an event. I don't know who forced us. It was a talk radio station way back when to do this climate event at Holy Family College. He's the big speaker. He shows up with a chauffeur and a giant limo to talk about the environment in the back. It was a little bit off-putting, but over the years, he was a good guy. He would come on, and this issue with our listeners of kids and health related to him uh, is a huge guy to buy in with President Trump, but you were one of the people... Yeah, Take I, us through... I sort of back-channeled that one, because, you know, again, I, I see what he's doing. We don't have to agree on everything. You know, we don't. But there are things, whether it's you know, government corruption, whether it's the deep state, whether it's a lot of the health issues, this is a guy that's on point. I, you know, again, I've gotten to know him. Uh, one of my good friends, business partners, is like best friends with his son and sort of linked us up. And, you know, I was like, wait a second. Like, it, it, he's not going to go anywhere with this. It was like, you know, it, it sort of didn't matter initially because it was like, you know, he was drawing from both sides kind of equally because – a lot of Democrats were like, we can't vote for Joe Biden. You know, we're not voting for, right, right. you know, a dementia-riddled, like, moron. Like, it, it, they just couldn't do it. You know, once they got Kamala Harris, they, they fell back into, like, usual Democrat mode, which is like, it doesn't matter her flaws, we're just going to get back in lockstep. So I said, the reality is this, like, I, you know, he's in shape, he's into the, like, I'm like, we, I think we'd get along. My buddy's like, oh, whether it was uh, my buddy, Tucker Carlson's like, you and Bobby should hang out because you guys would be, like, best friends. And so it was like, we started this sort of conversation suddenly. I kept everyone else out of it because, you know, in, you know, in, in, our, in the political world, it just leaks and then someone will try to come up with an excuse to, to sort of blow it up. So we took it pretty far. And like, the reality is like, I think the guy is incredible. Like, I, I've really become very friendly with him, very smart. And, and that's the reality. The Republican Party today, especially sort of that America, like, we're open to anyone. If you're going to be good at something, we don't have to agree on 100%, but like, Imagine what that guy could do. You give him HHS, you give him Health and Human Services, you, you put him in charge of the FDA or just blowing up the corruption in the FDA. You know, we, we eat foods, our kids, I have five young kids. Our, my, kids in America, we eat foods that are literally banned in other countries and it's like, it's fine. You know, well, what used to be big tobacco became big food and you know, you know they, they're paying lobbyists five million dollars a month to make sure that they can do it because they can save half a cent here while poisoning our children and like you know essentially neutering them and like, it's it's disgusting and so you know I, I think there's a lot of places uh, that he'd be great and honestly now that I've actually spent time I, mean, I spoke to him two hours ago uh, you know on issues unrelated to any of that and it's like wow the guy actually has a really good understanding of so much of the world 
uh, you know, whether it's the war, so everything going on, I mean, he, he gets it. And I, I honestly, I'm, I'm just honored to have him uh, as part of the team. I welcome it, and again, when it was against us, it's like, hey, I, I, I fight, right? So I'm gonna, but I, you know, now I, I have such a better understanding in the last few months getting to know him, like, I, I think he'd be an invaluable asset uh, to any team. But again, I, I, we're the only team that I think would give him uh, you know, the leeway to actually do what I think he could do incredibly. And I think that, that will serve our children uh, and so many Americans so well. We're going to see him out there more in the Oh, no, he's out there all the time. Yeah, we're, I'm doing events with him all over the place. We're, yeah, no, he, he's, he's, and again, it's not just that. It wasn't just like, hey, uh, you know, I'll throw my name behind Trump and, you know, whatever it is. And the guy, is, he's a workhorse, too. He's out there working, he's fighting. He, he calls me, like I said, I'll get a call. 10.30, hey, it's Bobby, can you talk for a few minutes? Sure. Like, you know, he's out there thinking about ideas, how to move things forward. It, uh, I, I could not be more impressed. So you are the broker behind the scenes, without being immodest not, about it, of some of the biggest things that have happened here. Just the biggest. I, I, know, yeah. my, I know what I'm good at, and I stay out yeah. of the other stuff. I'm not like the other guys in politics. I don't make any money in politics. Right. Like I, I, well, we owe New York State half a billion dollars for paying back a loan on time with interest. We're the alleged <laughs> victim where the alleged victim was testifying that they wanted to do more business with us, not less. So we've actually lost a lot of money in politics, but, but I'm the father of five young kids. I believe in America. I believe in the American dream. I believe in our Constitution. And I, and I think all of that stuff is honestly in grave danger right now, and that's, that's why I do this. So there's got to be the question. There's got to be, once all this is over with Dad. It's got to be an itch to get into the ring full time. You're in the ring. You're on. Rumble. Let's worry about 2024, Don. Oh, <laughs> uh, come on! Well, no, no, no. Look, I got plenty of time. Relax, here. Dom. Presses. Come on. You Calm down, Dom. That, don't you? You want to hear more? Of How it? many pints did Dom have before this one? Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Maybe one day. Maybe oh, one day. that's an opening. Let's stand. Cut that for tomorrow's show. Maybe one day. See, the problem is this. The problem is this. I like doing the stuff that the Republican side typically isn't all that good yes. at. I don't mind fighting. I don't mind getting in there. I don't care what they call me. I'll push back. I've created enough of a sort of a, let's call it a soapbox to get it out there. You still have to want the day job, you know? And they'd be like, you know, they, they pulled me to run for Senate in Florida, and I, you know, I beat pretty, you know, competent people by a lot. And I'm like, but then I got to go be a senator. Like, I, there's almost no interest in that, you know? So, uh... Well, there's only one job, the yeah, presidency, there, yeah, right? Well, I, yeah, that, you know, again, yeah. my father, that may be different. It's, you know, so, you know, you never know in time, but you got to actually want that day job hard. There's a lot to that. Um, okay. I can do a lot more, frankly, in my mind right now outside helping other guys that I think have that talent, whether it was, you know, a JD or whatever. You know, like, they, I went to bat for him hard for that Senate seat. I used basically all of my political capital for the cycle to make that happen, and then I, then I put in the effort and the time, uh, you know, to, to try to, to help him actually win. Uh, and I think that was a great, that was a great investment of my time and, you know, resources. I think he's been incredible. So, you know, no matter what, I'll always be in the game. It's just a question at what level. All right, a few questions from listeners. We love uh, listeners. We have these in advance. Uh, Lynn, who wrote this for you, uh, Don, wanted to know, how has the assassination attempt affected him and his family? It's been swept under the rug as if it never happened, wasn't addressed in the debate at all, wondering if a private investigation is going on. Yeah, I imagine, listen, I, I imagine however that's been done, you know, a private investigation is not going to come up with anything. You know, they, they I mean, think about it. I just, again, I, I'm about plausibility, right? Like, Ackman's razor, like, what's the most likely answer? Like, does anyone really believe that a 20-year-old kid became so radicalized, so radicalized that he would try to assassinate a former president? But... But he had no social media footprint. He had no online footprint. It just, it just magically got into his head. You know, I, I don't think you find anything in a private thing. You know, it, it's sort of like OJ looking for the killer just walking around in the circle, right? It's, just, it's like, come on. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's just not going to happen. You know, whatever roadblocks will be there, they say, you know, so they, they cremated the body almost immediately. There's, it, it's like... You, you, you see the actors at play again, you know, and again, you look at history, you look at the stuff, Kennedy, whatever it may be, and you're like, come on, is there any other, is there any other real response? You know, Trump's a threat to a lot of those guys, right? That, you know, he wants to stop the never-ending war, so how does everyone else in D.C. get rich? Or you think the Cheneys became Kamala Harris endorsing Democrats because, like, they believe in, you know, the, no, they just... 
they're probably parlaying and figuring out how to make billions off the wars like they did with Iraq and everything else for the last 25 years. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just not naive to believe any of those things anymore. Another listener question, and I think it's apropos of tonight, what uh, President Trump said at a rally. Why didn't President Trump emphasize his position on eliminating taxes and Social Security and tips? The tips didn't come up. Did Trump say tonight, though, on overtime, eliminating the taxes on that? Yeah, well, because, you know, Kamala Harris will go out and say, she, it's the same policy, right? You know, she, she'll put on a MAGA hat if she needs to to try to win. Joe Biden put on one yesterday, by the way. <laughs> but, but again, that's the thing. So, you know, remember, you know, she's the agent of change, apparently, according to the media, but she's had four years to change things. And the only things that have changed have changed for the worse. That's the reality. If Kamala Harris wanted to do any of these things, she could do it right now. She's the vice president of the United States, and she's vice president to arguably the most incompetent and absentee president in history. That's not funny. It's sad. Right? He is. He spent 40% of his time on vacation. What? Raise your hand if you, got, if you get fired if you spend 40% of your time on vacation. I know I would. There's not a person in here that could do that unless you're self-employed, okay? So if she wanted to do anything, she could have done any one of these things. She could do it right now. She could shut down the border, you know, all these things. You're going to build a wall. It's like, well, why didn't you build the wall for the last five years, four years, right? They stopped. They paid the contractors the cost of completing the wall. They said, leave the materials where it was. They sold them off for pennies on the dollar because they wanted an open border. Again, this is a radical California liberal. That's not going to change. She's the daughter of a Marxist. That'd be like me being like Trump and being like soft. Like, it's, I don't know. It's, it's not going to happen probably, right? You don't just change. Um, so the reality is she could have done any of these things, but she'll tell you whatever you need to hear to do it. They did it in this area. Frankly, it's the perfect example. Fracking, right? Pennsylvania, all that. Remember the Democrat primary debates of 2020. Raise your hand if you would eliminate fracking and destroy American energy. Every Democrat on that stage raised their hand. But in the debate against my father, I would never do that. But you said you'd do it. I would never do that. Media, he would never do that. That would destroy our energy independence. That would destroy tens of thousands of jobs. That would destroy you know, the vote in Pennsylvania. Right? He would never do that. Oh, okay, maybe he won't do it. Day one, Keystone Pipeline, first executive order, gone. That was our energy independence. That's national security. That's tens of thousands of good, you know, paying jobs for hardworking Americans, just gone. Now we import oil from Venezuela, a regime we didn't recognize, and Iran, the world's leading state sponsor of terror. We could have been doing it ourselves, but they told us, no way. People believed them. You know, I get it. It's hard to get by in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris' America right now. People don't have time to follow this stuff like you guys would. We're all, if you're in this room right now, you're probably a political junkie. Like, you're into this stuff. Me too. Right? But the average person, a couple minutes of news a day, and it's David Muir? I mean, well, Trump must be, he must really be Hitler. He must be. David Muir said so. I mean, <laughs> Kamala Harris' sorority sister is the other moderator. I'm sure. And the head of ABC News is the person that set up Kamala Harris with her husband. I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to get a fair shot here, folks. But, you know, they'll tell you whatever it is that you want to hear. I mean, Kamala Harris was the, I'm not going to take your guns. Like 10 days ago, she was pushing gun buyback programs. That is taking your guns. But she'll tell you that she's not going to get fact-checked. They know about it. They knew about fracking. No one fact-checked them because they're not going to, because they're fine with the results, however they get there. They can bastardize democracy all they want to get what they want, and then it doesn't matter, because they're fine with it. They'll be behind their fences and their walls, and they'll have their armed guards. Actual Americans, like real Americans, they have to suffer. And that's not acceptable anymore. Absolutely. Um, Don, at this point, Whenever we talk with someone at these great events, I like to do a little lightning round. You've hit a few, but just your impressions. Let me start off in the lightning round, and listeners wanted this one, number one. Taylor Swift. <laughs> Listen, honestly, I think, I think J.D. Vance sort of said it best. You know, when, when your grocery costs go up by 20%, it hurts you. It doesn't change anything for Taylor Swift. 
right? right? It's not going to stop her from flying on her Global Express all over the world. Yeah, it's just, I, I don't know that she's in tune. Like, my daughters like her music, um, but, but like, right. you know, I, I don't know that anyone should vote based on that. I mean, it, you know, vote based on what you see with your own eyes. The media will tell you those eyes are lying to you, but like, if I see it, I'm sure you see it. Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> I think there's a priest in the front row. We need an exorcism. <laughs> that may be too much for you, Father. I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'd subject you to that. But, yeah. uh, the Cheneys. Well, we covered that. But like, listen, if the Cheneys are endorsing against us, that's the most positive endorsement I think you could have in American politics right now. You know, they've sent, you know, more Americans and, and, and people of, you know, other nations to their death for nothing for far too long. And, you know, honestly, the faster they're out of, uh, you know, American politics, the better it could be for everyone. Don, the question tonight, I really start from myself because I don't know if you agree with me, so I won't say what I think. But I will say that the number one thing I'm going to remember about President Trump, other than the humor, other than the shakeup, under all these things we've seen, Republican Party getting out of unending wars. Yeah. That will be the biggest legacy. Yeah. Seriously, it's... I would, you, yeah, now, I mean, you've been inside that. It's shocking where the Republican Party has come. Well, it's, it's shocking, frankly, the reversal, right? right. I mean, yes. the Democrats are now the party of censorship. They're the party of jailing their political opponents. Right. They're the party of never-ending wars. Like, it, it's, it's literally like you know, a, a role reversal. Where did that from come from? Though? What, what's your sense? I mean, Trump inside. arrangement syndrome. I think they just like, you no, know, I, I mean, if Donald Trump says father, the sky is blue, you know, they'll say, no, it's purple. It's I, a, I'm asking, where did your father come up with that, though, that that is something that drove? Remember, 2016, in the beginning, when that was said, it wasn't necessarily well received. It took a while for people to get where that was coming from. Because my father has something that most politicians and bureaucrats don't have. He has common sense. Um, you see it right now. You see it on it. You see it right now in Ukraine, right? We spent 250 billion billion dollars. Can anyone here in this room articulate what victory looks like? No, because I haven't been told, and I do this every day. No one knows. We're just going to fund it inevitably, right? Because someone's making a lot of money. The war machine is funding it. I got calls even from Republicans. Don, stop talking so aggressively about Ukraine. You know, you know, the money, some of it's going back to, like, the big war machine here, and it's, like, American business. I'm like, no, 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 no. They're sending, you know, Zelensky is sending what he deems to be some peasant in Ukraine to go die on the front lines against a force that's overwhelming. You know, every time I hear Russia, Ukraine made a strong victory, a Russian... Jeep got a flat tire. You know, yeah. Ukraine withdrew out of a quadrant of the country. It was a strategic withdrawal. It's, it's insane. So my father's been looking at this stuff for years. It, honestly, it was like the Oprah. Uh, we, we brought up Oprah earlier. Like, my father was talking about the same thing as it related to trade in the 80s on Oprah's show. At that time, it was Japan that was taking advantage of it in trade. Now it's China. He's actually been incredibly consistent throughout his entire career. Some of the players may change. But, but it's common sense. He sees it. He's like, no one has articulated what this actually gets us. We've been doing that forever. And, you know, but people just sort of, you know, blindly went along. Well, no, we're at war. It's patriotism. It's like, well, no, but like, if Americans are dying for no reason, just so a couple guys in D.C. can get rich, that's a problem. If tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Iraqis or Afghanis or whatever are dying, and we don't really know why we're there, like, that's a problem. You know, the, the war machine's never going to stop that. You see it. It's just like Ukraine's are immediately just like, well, man, we haven't been at war in like six months. Like, we've got to get back at the game. They watch Big Pharma get rich for a couple of years. It's like, okay, we, you know, it's our turn back at the dole. Uh, and so I, I think just as a common sense guy, he saw that there was no value proposition. There was no, there was no upside in it really for America. And he just said, this is ridiculous. Enough is enough. I still want to say, though, to me, that it's bold. To do that in a Republican primary, because I've been doing this for a long time. That's why they attacked him the way When I saw that, and we remember initially, it was not necessarily people were like, we're the Republican Party. We supported George Bush. We supported all that went on. And suddenly, this guy's saying something different. But it stuck. Yeah, but it's Einstein's definition of insanity, right? You you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. But you don't ever get it, right? That was the reality. We saw that, whether, you know, th- throughout. And, you know, you've been in these wars for 25 years. There's no real end in sight. There's no real upside. There's no this. All there is is death and carnage and, and cost. And you're like, 
maybe we gotta, maybe we gotta change. Maybe we don't just have to do the same thing over and over again. And I think my, you know, my father figures that out a little faster than most. And now I think everyone, you know, is sort of in consensus on this stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not still a lot of unhappy people in DC that will try to snake them because, you know, they, they got to get back in there because, you know, that's their retirement package. Exactly. We've been talking about letters to Trump tonight. I wanted to talk about your book, Triggered. We had you on talking about that. And one of the ideas that you had in there was to talk about the tricks of the left and how to counter them. And that was one of the big premises. Talk about that a little bit. Well, listen, again, we, we've seen, you know, there's nothing they won't do, say, you know, try to pull over. There's no, there's no limit to the madness, really. But, you know, the, the reality is, I think, and I'm starting to see it. I mean, I think you see it a little bit with cancel culture. It's not really that much of a thing anymore, even, even if you're conservative. And trust me, no one knows better than me and my family, probably, maybe the Kennedys, uh, you know, the consequence of sort of uh, speaking out against, against the machine. You know, there, there are consequences. There are penalties to that. They'll go after you. Uh, the reality is, at this point, we don't have a choice. We have to become unafraid. We, we can't, you know, make entire life decisions about, you know, worried about what the mom at Starbucks is going to say while in line. Like, that, like you know, uh, that woke mind virus is disgusting. When I look at the hills to die on of today's Democrat Party, it's like, well, let's make sure we allow three-year-olds to change their gender, permanently mutilating their bodies without parental consent. And if, if the parents disagree with this, we're going to pull the children away in a government-sanctioned kidnapping. Like, that's really happening. Right? That's not, you know, Kamala Harris wants to fund sex change operations with your taxpayer dollars for any illegal, any person in the prison system who decides they want to... Think of the insanity. Our military. Oh, yeah, sex change operations. You can do that. No wonder there's a recruiting problem. No, no, but they, you get every lunatic in the world, then they go there, they do that, then they're in so many drugs, they can't actually serve on the front line, so it's like a free way to... They check a box that they did military service, they're never going to actually be at risk. They get their government-funded sex change operation, and then, you know, shockingly, patriotic Americans don't want a part of that, so they don't sign up anymore. Uh, we have to, number one, become unafraid. We have to use our voices. We can do that respectfully. We can do that intelligently. We don't have to be, you know, not everyone has to go as aggressive as me. Uh, but, but apathy, that's what's going to kill us in the long run, right? That, that's what's going to get us. If we sit back there and just accept it and just sort of, oh, well, let we can't live and let live. They won't let us live and let live. Right? You know, they talk about that all the time, but you know, they, they won't let us have our guns if they can have their way. They won't let us have our free speech. They won't talk about our ideas. You know, everything they don't like is a conspiracy theory. All the conspiracy theories have been proven to be basically true. Uh, you know, we've all been killed for that. I mean, you know, remember Wuhan lab leak theory. Like, like honestly, who with an IQ of above, like, let's call it seven? Okay. Didn't, like, wasn't like, you mean to tell me? The Wuhan virus that started at ground zero in Wuhan, where the lab that studies the exact virus in question, like, it didn't come from there. No, 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 it came from three feet outside of that lab, totally unrelated. Like, but if you're in medicine and you had a government grant, Anthony Fauci would pull your money if you did that. You'd lose tenure if you were at a college. Like, of course, they canceled me for it. I was like, like, what do you know? You're not a virologist. I go, yeah, I'm not a virologist, but I'm also not an idiot. Like, of course, like, what are you talking about? Like, you, uh, so we are clear. You do not have to be a virologist to be like, of course it came from there. Exactly. But we have to be willing just to speak up. You know, don't let them put you in a corner. You know, the, the silent majority is much bigger than it is, but they, a lot of people, and I, again, I understand the consequence, but like, I think that consequence is getting mitigated. I think more and more people are doing that. And once we have that wave of people that are just unafraid to actually speak their mind, to understand what's going on, to talk about it, uh, you know, I, I think we actually win. I think we win on these issues, but you know, we're up against a trillion dollars of big tech. We're up against a trillion dollars of mainstream media. Like we're not in a fair fight. Like, you know, don't pretend that we are. We have to fight accordingly. Do you consider yourself a member of the media now, with Rumble, et cetera? You're on the other side of the microphone. You got the microphone. Independent now. media. You're, you're a member of the media, no, just like I, I am. Well, I, I can do that because then I get you know when they start subpoenaing me again, I'm just going to say I'm, I'm a journalist. So yes, for the record, I am a journalist. Uh, no, but hey, listen, I, you know, I, I'm out there doing you know the, the podcast on Rumble, my triggered podcast, and have have a lot of fun with that because you know I'll, I'll have the conversations that you're not going to see in the news that are real. 
that are there. We'll interview the people that are talking about these things. So, you know, we got to get it out there. We got to pull, you know, just like we have to pull sort of money from woke corporate, but, you know, I, I do all my stuff in sort of the patriot economy, whether it's, you know, from that standpoint or even from a businesses like with Public Square, like, you know, you spend your hard earned dollars with companies that hate your guts. And then they use it to weaponize it against you, whether they're funding Planned Parenthood or, you know, radical transgender ideology or whatever it may be. Like, we have to start making an effort to support, like, American small businesses, people whose values align with you, not just take the easy button, you know, clicking a button at Amazon. Yeah, so I've done that with, like, you know, Public Square. Like, there's so many ways we can fight back. You know, but, like, you know, go on publicsquare.com, you know, download the app, like, find the businesses around you, the coffee shop, the restaurant, the lawyers, or whatever, that, that share your values. Like, support them. Put their kids through hockey practice or whatever it may be. Like, you know, not some woke juggernaut, uh, you know, that's literally going to, you know, weaponize your hard-earned money against you. And if we all make that effort, if we all stop, start talking... There's so many things we can do to push back. I guarantee you, you pull back that money from woke corporate, their stock prices go down 20%, they're going to shut the hell up. Well, I promise you, they're going to stop doing time. it. They, yeah, exactly. You know, there's been no consequence to them thus far being radical. There's only consequence to our side. We start showing them some consequence, and again, that's, that's just voting with your wallet. That's peaceful, it's, it's as easy as pie. You can do that, but we just have to make the effort to find that, not just go, oh, you know, it's easier to go on Amazon than what that last week. It takes two more seconds, just, you know, stop funding those who are literally, they, they'd throw you in the gulags if they had an option. You asked me backstage, I'm not revealing any kind of confidence, just a general question, how is it going to turn out, how is it going in Pennsylvania? And uh, one of the great joys of this job is, I think I have an answer to that. Are we going to win in Pennsylvania? Here tonight... We have uh, Linda Kearns and another colleague who are working with the Trump organization, the Trump campaign, as our keeper of integrity. And I've said, it's on them, yep. that job, it's a big job. Where's Linda? Where's Linda tonight? Stand up there, Linda Kearns. Did she leave already? Yeah. I, was I boring you, Linda? No, I don't think so. I can't see into the crowd. And, and, uh... yeah. There she is, okay. All right. I thought maybe I'm doing a lousy job, but Linda was like, forget this guy, no, I'm out of here. No, we have her on a lot. And, and Don, I am, I am thrilled to tell you that the things that we see that have happened this time around versus 2020 in Pennsylvania were in a lot better hands. But you're the guy really plugged in, after all, with the president. Give us an idea what we're going to see, and I know it's fluid. Anything could happen. It's totally what are fluid. we going to be doing over the next 50 days? The biggest thing, get out, vote, vote early, check your registration. I actually did my, my triggered podcast last week. I did a, uh, a whole show with Scott Pressler, uh, you know, yeah, who's just honestly he's a workhorse. He's been out there like an animal, like, but you go through all the dates. And again, a lot of that will apply in the swing states. If you know other people in other swing states, obviously Pennsylvania is going to be a big one of those. This was a little bit, you know, Pennsylvania specific, but, you know, sort of the dates, when things start, when you can no longer change your registration. If you have kids that are in college in Pennsylvania, you know, versus... You, right. know, you may live in New York. It's like their vote's better in Pennsylvania. They can do that. You can still do that now. Don't wait until the last day. Don't, you know, we, we've done that too much. We vote on the day, and I get it. Like, I want no, nothing more than to have normal, sane elections like the rest of the world. Even the communists in Europe, you know, they're like, what do you mean you don't have paper ballots with ID and same-day elections and, like, you know. Yeah. You know, but we don't because the other side is setting the rules. Right now, we have to play their game. We just have to play it better and smarter. So, you know, get out there, vote early, go check out that podcast episode, send it to your friends. It'll give you the dates, the deadlines, what you need to do. You just don't want to get there on election day or, you know, God forbid, you know, it's raining in a conservative county on election day. So people sit at home because they like, I don't want to get wet. You know, do it early, you know, bank the vote. We, we have to, we can't let the other side have a 50 day election cycle, you know, while we have one day and we hope for no snow. Like it's, that's not smart. So we, we have to play that game, and we have to get involved across the board. We're in Pennsylvania handling that. What are you seeing in the other states? What are you hearing? Give us a sense yeah, a, a of lot where of similar. we are. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of sort of grassroots. You know, I know in Arizona, a lot's being done by turning point. So you're not doing it with the traditional sort of RNC model. Like, there's guys that just know their areas. They know their people. They know how to mobilize. They know how to get that stuff going. So they're like, well, the, the RNC's not doing this. It's like, it's fine. We, we know everyone. The rules have changed, so we're working collectively. Uh, with guys like that. So, like, you know, Turning Point's do a great job in, you know, Arizona and Wisconsin. You know, other guys are handling different different states. So, you know, the biggest thing, again, just no apathy. Get involved. Call every person you know. Make sure they know it. Make sure they know the deadlines. Make sure they're registered. Make sure, you know, that it's all correct. 
every vote's going to count. There's nothing the other side's not going to do. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're, we're better now at looking at what they're going to do. But again, they're, hey, they're much more vicious. They're much more evil. Uh, you know, they got teams of lawyers that you wouldn't believe that do nothing but try to figure out how to, how to screw up that system, you know, in, in their advantage. And so, you know, every vote's going to matter. We just have to get out there and do it. One parting area I thought would be fun to end on after all this stuff, and it's been great, is uh, you were on The View, at least in my research is correct, the 5,000th episode on The View. Oh, that was fun. It was epic. And you're being accused of trying to set up the morons on The View, which is relatively easy to do, uh, bringing up outrageous things like uh, Joy Behar and blackface. So I didn't us. set them up. Listen, I was on the 5,000th episode. It was when my book had come out, and they were like, hey, you know, would you come on The View and talk about your book? So I'm a big boy. I don't mind fighting. I understand that that is not going to be a friendly crowd. But I do expect at least a little bit of courtesy if you invite me on to talk about my book that you'll actually even bring up my book, which they didn't. So now, again, it's, it's five on one. And Kimberly was there, actually, so it was you know, five on two. But, you know, I'm, yeah, a little diff it's different. She's sort of the voice of reason. Um, so, you know, but if I went out aggressive right out of the gate, you know, then I'm a chauvinist, I'm a misogynist, I'm a terrible human being. So, you know, I had to let him go after me a little bit. And after a while, I was like, okay, you know. So I figured it was going to go bad, and I just wanted to be sure. So before that, I looked up, like, the dumbest things ever said on The View. <laughs> the list is long and not so distinguished, folks. But, you know, I, yeah, I, I had, you know, Joy Behar and Blackface and Whoopi Goldberg supporting Roman Polanski, a literal pedophile, uh, and, like, all of these things. So I was like... Okay, well, you know what? You think that, I think this. But, you know, we've all made mistakes. For example, Whoopi. And so what was great is I wish you could see it because the, the best part of that show, I, I had grown men come up to me for like the next couple of weeks be like, you were great on The View. I was like, <laughs> I was like what were you doing watching The View? They're like, um, uh, I, just, I just saw the highlights. I was like, yeah, sure you did. Uh, but, but it was sort of amazing that they, they, they're so used to just people coming on. You know, someone's, yeah, I was there pitching a book. They didn't let me pitch my book, but it doesn't matter. But everyone goes in there with kid gloves because they want to be invited back. Me, I could care less. I'll burn the place down. It doesn't, you know, it means, it, it means nothing to me. So, so I did. And, you know, again, they come at people like that, but they've never had anyone actually push back on them. So, yeah, the people said it was the, the, one of the highest rated ever, like, just murders on TV. <laughs> Uh, you know, people were calling 911, but the best part was, the best part was when they went to commercial break. You know, I, it was a crowd, it was probably like, a, you know, 125 people in the crowd. I got 10 tickets. So I brought a couple friends, uh, you know, just 10, but they 10 of 125 in New York City, so less than 10%. But, you know, they'd clap for me, and when I started making my points, it was amazing to watch. Because this, like, New York City liberal stacked audience that wanted to hate me were like, wait, that happened? Like, oh, yeah, it happened. So Whoopi Goldberg in the commercial breaks is, sorry, father, MFing the audience. This is a Mago rally! This is, shut the, up! Like, cursing, screaming. Like, I wish, I wish we had the outtake clips because she lost her mind uh, in the commercial breaks. Like, However much they lost their minds during the show, it was 100x worse. Like, I wish we just filmed it. Like, it, it was so good. It was amazing. Like, you, you really missed something. It was probably, it would have been one of the greatest moments in television history. And Donna... They, they literally, the, the, the View lost their audience, basically, and, like, she could not handle it. I get this every day. Why, I have not been invited back since, by the way. My producer and I get this every day. Why do you play these women on The View? You know why we play them. Look at the reaction. Look at what the reaction yeah, that you just, got yeah, to it. Exactly. You yeah. have to. But they're just, they're, there's no tie to reality, right? So, I mean, they talk as though they're, you know, they're preaching the gospel, but you, you break it down, it's like, they, I mean, they're truly stupid people. Like, it's, it's no, it's, it's like, so, you know, it, it's shocking that they have, that they're still on the air, actually, or have any influence, but it's like, every time they do a segment that seems like a hippie, I'm like, I feel like that's good for us, meaning in the real world. Uh, and so, yeah, no, it, it's good. I, th I think they're a great asset for common sense because they have none. All right, I got to say, we are counting down to the election of our lifetime. This time, it really is the election of our lifetime. And thank God we have Don Trump Jr. barnstorming the country to do this. Please come back again. Please support him here. And thanks to everyone that came out tonight. Thanks to our entire staff.
been a and Father, thank you for coming out tonight. I'm sure we have your blessing after this. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you. At, Get out there and fight. We'll see you at the bar.